powered by Riverside FM. Soldier of Fortune magazine was founded in 1975 by Vietnam veteran Robert K. Brown. Something of a misfit combatant, Brown went to Africa to find action in the Rhodesian War. While there, Brown compiled an information packet for others who wanted to find work as Soldiers of Fortune. That project eventually evolved into what became the Touchstone Adventure magazine that focused on military, professional soldiers, guns and gear. Although the magazine may have been forged in the fires of real conflict, SOF soon drifted into sensationalism to garner enormous sales. Social of Fortune magazine has had its fair share of controversies since its inception. In the 1980s, SOF was sued on three individual counts for running Gun for Hire Classifieds, advertising for contract killers. Soldier of Fortune's original pairing company, Paladin Press, was taken to court after publishing a book on how to be a contract killer. Unfortunately, someone used the advice to conduct a plot to kill three people. Fortunately, the plan fell through due to faulty knowledge. The book wasn't conjured up by some military expert, but instead a housewife who had never committed a crime in her entire life. It should be no surprise then that a video game adaptation of Soldier of Fortune magazine would follow in its source material's footsteps. Released almost a year after the Columbine High School massacre, and a year before the September 11th attacks, Soldier of Fortune was developed to stoke conversation around the depiction of violence in video games. Enemies could be realistically decapitated, to a fidelity not seen at the time. This was in a midst to enhance the realism of Soldier of Fortune's setting, which dealt with the counterinsurgency work done by contract mercenaries. Less realistic was the accomplishments performed by its main protagonist, despite the fact that he was derived from a real military consultant. Soldier of Fortune is a relic of a bygone era, finding more in common with the right-wing vigilante action movies that define the era the magazine came from. But can we look back at the title with the same kind of ironic relevance we say for First Blood Part 2, Cobra, or any of the films produced by the Canon Movie Company? On this episode of Bullet Time, our look at the shooters of Raven Software continues with 2000's Soldier of Fortune. Otherwise, um, like a, a corporate entity had taken it over or something. It, I don't know. I couldn't quite get my head around it. No, well, that's the thing is, I think they formed a corporation mm. to make the game, right? With investors and all that stuff, and then the three of the three leads for the game left in at the end of twenty twenty one involuntarily. He says. I don't know what shape that involuntary leaving is. There's just right. a lot. It's a, it was like kind of like a, it was cause that's the thing. It's, it's a very short statement. Yeah. Um, it doesn't answer a lot of questions and that the people who have been, who worked on the three main writers, I guess, and or designers of disco Elysium left it 10 months ago or like nearly yeah. a year ago. They've been gone. It's like, it's not, it's Pretty like, much it, it was pretty much after the director's cut or the final cut, whatever it was called, was wrapped up. Like, they left. Yeah, they, went, they left, so... Um, um, and it was involuntary. So there's not a lot of... There's not a lot of information out there. It's just kind of... It, it's just kind of a lot of weird vibes. Um, yeah. So... I don't Do you think that could happen to Bullet Time? Obviously. Well, you you write a letter from a. Um, I'm going to write a letter a from a psych. Yeah, I'm going to write a letter a from a hospital, course. stating Bullet that bullet time is no more. <laughs> I declare this bullet time dissolved. to be do over. Not, do not listen to James. He has no involvement in the project anymore. If he tweets out episodes, those are fakes. Those aren't the if real. If he says episodes. he's involved in the project, he does not. Yeah, is not involved in the project. So speak. Speaking of being not involved in the project, uh, hi folks, welcome to Bullet Time, the video game podcast where we talk about the <laughs> Jesus that missed their mark. Uh, not talking about Disco Elysium today, though, even though that is uh, what we were talking about previously. Um, I guess we are talking about some which kind of has a corporation element to sure. it very lightly. Um, yeah. 
And if you're a fan of political games like Disco Elysium, and you thought, well, I've had my fill of leftist content, what does the other side say, say? Then, oh boy, have we got the game for you today. We got a but game for you. Before we get into that, um, joining me on this mini-series, That's So Raven, where we look at the games of Raven software, uh, is the John Mullins of video game literature himself, <laughs> Kevin from Pixel Lit. <laughs> So I really enjoy that every time that you've introduced me, it's been like a villain. And then today you use John Mullins, which is who's the main character of the game. I think it's just beautiful. I mean, is he the hero of the game, though? He's the main protagonist, but... He's the protagonist, yeah. Is, is, is he the hero? Well, probably not. <laughs> no, not uh, considering the um, some of the stuff that he does, very questionable. Yeah. Uh, like... But the game that we're talking about today, folks, is from the year 2000, Soldier of Fortune, which, if you listen to the previous episode that we did on Hexen 2, is a game that, up until we decided to do Raven Software, is a game that I had absolutely no idea existed, which, uh, Kevin, would you say that that was the same for you, or did were you aware of it? Uh, I, I, that's the thing is I'm not sure if I was aware of it or if I was aware of the magazine. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like the, the, the magazine was something I had heard of. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure I knew that there was a game <clears throat> and it's not a, it's not a coincidence. The game is, is we'll get into it. It's, it's all tied, all tied together. Soldier of Fortune is not, the title is not chosen randomly. No, that is, um, it is very much tied together. But as stated, coming out, folks, it's the turn of the, of the millennium. We're, we're here. We're in the new century. We got a brand new 1,000 years of games to look forward to after the, uh, you know. And coming out thousands. strong is Soldier of Fortune. Yeah. Uh, so, Kevin, let me uh, tell me, what, what were some things to look forward to when this came out on a uh, March twenty eighth, two thousand. Yeah, it's end of end of March, beginning of April. Uh, in the movies, you could go watch Aaron Brockovich. That was good that film. Was, that was that was up there. Uh, playing on the radio, uh, you got "Say My Name" by oh, Destiny's, Destiny's Child. Child. Oh. Is 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 hot right there? And on the day it's released in North America, which was April third. Um, Microsoft is ruled to have violated antitrust laws. So, oh, with Internet Explorer, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, that's... yeah. So wow. that was that was a big deal. And in more local Florida news, uh, later that I think it was later that month, Elian Gonzalez is uh, the six year old boy. Elian Gonzalez was forcibly deported back to Cuba. Oh no. Um, is it is a it's a sad story. So basically, his mom takes him um, right. on a on a boat to escape to Florida. Um, everybody else on the boat dies except for Ilian, and oh, gosh. he it, he goes and he lives with his relatives in Miami. His dad in Cuba is like, I want him back in Cuba, and then the the. I think Janet Reno, who uh, rules, who is the um, secretary of state at the time in the U.S., is like, no, he's got to go back. And there's a really it, they they go to his house, his his relative's house, at and they have their guns drawn. The immigration officers, they're like, they have like machine guns out and everything. It's the the pull the picture that there's a picture oh. that won a Pulitzer Prize of like him. Being six years old, and there's like a immigration officer with a machine gun pointing. At I was him. going to say, is that the? Um, that's the yeah, that's the image of the little kid and the SWAT. Yeah, like that yeah. image was just just become like. I yeah, mean, I even think like South Park parodied it. Like, yeah, that was uh, that was that was right around this time, and uh, he ends up oh, going back to Cuba, um, and he has a nice little life for himself as a as an engineer, I believe. Okay, uh, so down uh, in Cuba. At a company that produces large vats of plastic or like things to contain chemicals. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, uh, good to um, good to get abreast of um, uh, Elio Gonzalez. See what he's up to. Yeah. You think he? You think he was playing Soldier of Fortune when it came out? Probably. You know, not. Probably uh, as a six-year-old, I don't. 
I, I, I don't think he was, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, Aaron Brockovich, the only thing I know about... Well, I have seen the film, and it's a pretty good film, but the only thing I... Uh, my bit of knowledge on that is that it was nominated for an Oscar alongs, uh, for Best Picture alongside Traffic, which were both uh, Steven Soderbergh films that came out shot around the same time, came out in the same year, and so essentially he was competing against himself, and I believe it was Aaron... I think it was either Aaron Brockovich or it was Traffic was the one that won um, him Best Director, and he gave, um, according to the Academy Awards... One of the best speeches that you can possibly do as a um, as an acceptance speech, which was literally, he went on stage, he made a joke, which is, well, I probably shouldn't go into work tomorrow, and then <laughs> followed it up. I know, good, good little joke, and then followed it up with, um, there's all sorts of people that Steven. I could thank, and I will do so in person after the show, but um, this goes to anybody who's ever wanted to pick up a camera and, you know, wants to get into filmmaking. Nice, short, and to the point. Short, and yep, uh, the, st- he won it for traffic. That's right. There we go. Uh, traffic, which the only thing I know about that film, other than it's a adaptation of a British miniseries, is that it's the film that invented whenever you go to Mexico and you give it's it the, the orange filter. filter. Mex- Mexico yeah. is orange. U.S. is blue. Uh, that was it. He was the movie. guy who invented. Maybe the different parts <laughs> of the world should have different gels, so we know. You know. So we know they're we different. We know where we which, are. Yeah. Which the only one that they ever seem to take the the one that goes forward is obviously Mexico, where they give it the yellow filter, which reaches levels of lunacy in like one of the first, like maybe the second season of Breaking Bad, where they go to Mexico and it looks like it's being shot through a beer bottle. It is so <laughs> bad. That's amazing. It's oh, pretty God. good. Um, uh, interesting though, a little bit of foreign policy, a little bit about talking about how different parts of the world are recreated through visual language and also just kind of the seedy side of stuff because folks, the game we're talking about today is getting into all of that, which, where do we even start with talking about, so do we talk about what it's based on? Do we talk about like, yeah, what when it, it what- what is it based on? What is how, how does this what what is going on here? I, I, so I, mean, I have to do research. There's a magazine. There's a magazine there called a... Soldier of Fortune, which I've yeah, seen so... like sitting out on magazine racks for whatever reason. I've never even looked into it though. I've never opened it. I was just like, that's weird. Moving so <laughs> yeah. So Soldier of Fortune very much is like it's exact. It's exactly what you think it is, like, magazine-wise. It's founded in 1975 by a guy called Robert K. Brown, who's a Vietnam veteran. And basically, Vietnam War finishes, he still wants to fight, and he discovers that in Africa, the Rhodesian War is going on, and he goes, well, you know what? I'm going to head over there, and I'm going to see if I can find, like, some action. I'm going to become a soldier of fortune. And while he's over there, um, he manages to make connections with one of the leaders of this who's like, we want to find soldiers. And so gives him information. And so Robert essentially creates like a package of information to hand to people back in the United States saying, hey, if you can handle a gun and you can take care of yourself, come over to um, Rhodesia. We need you to help us out. For some bizarre reason, that then evolves into a magazine of um, hey, here's all the cool soldier stuff that you can look for. Here's some cool wars that are happening in this part of the world. Look at all this cool gear and equipment that we have. (laughs) It is very much like... I mean, I think as a British person, I find this like kind of very weird, but then I think also for you, this is like a world that... uh, Basically, folks, I know that we both are, you know, handsome hunky men, but when it comes to kind of like sort of very kind of macho right wing stuff, not really a world we know much about, which is obviously why we're such a good fit for this podcast about shooting games. But so I don't know, very much after World War Two and kind of into the Cold War, where it becomes this whole thing of like it's less 
fought through direct conflict, but more so you have proxy wars and you have espionage, but yeah. it's mostly done as a propaganda thing. It's, right. So in the United States, a lot of it is, as well as you have your Red Scare stuff, a lot of it is fronting, as in making the American Empire look as tough as possible. So even though World War II, the Great War, the war to essentially end all wars, defeat fascism, finishes, yeah, America still finds itself getting involved in a lot of international conflicts. And Vietnam obviously being a pretty good example of that, where there is separatist units in between North Vietnam and South Vietnam, where, right. you know, communism and uh not communism yeah. america decides to get involved in that it's and, and it's so, weird it's fun it's fun to to really look into like well we're you know uh we're we're fighting uh we're 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 going against the ussr and we're like well we're not like the ussr has more direct actions in like places like afghanistan that could have yes. actually been been like addressed rather than like indirect stuff and it's weird like ussr is doing direct stuff places that probably could have been uh engaged with and the u.s was more interested in the places where the it seemed like the ussr was just kind of like maybe providing some funding maybe providing some yeah weapons. so like places like nicaragua <laughs> where obviously you have the contra counter-revolutionaries who are you know the us is funding them to basically kind of establish yeah. capitalism in the area which right i would say we're gonna try our best to stay out of politics not so much that we don't want this to be a political podcast but more so I'm not an expert on it. Um, more so, more so politics in the entertainment sphere, where I think is where, especially after World War II, and especially where kind of the American film industry kind of reignites again following the end of World War II and becomes this powerhouse culture, not just in the Northern Hemisphere, but pretty much across the world. Um, we do get like still films of kind of American supremacy and wars that are fought either at home or abroad. And right. I think it kind of comes to a head a lot, sort of at the end of the 70s and the early 80s, where Ronald Reagan comes into power and you have the likes of low-budget action movies, the stuff that's made by Canon Films, uh, mm -hmm. where you have, like, Chuck Norris, you have, um, like, Dolph Lundgren's in a couple of these films. Commando, arguably could kind of fit within this as well. You have all the John Millius stuff, so not only Red Dawn, <clears throat> which is explicitly about <laughs> the Russians invading... Yeah, I know, the Russians invading the US. The funny... The, it will be Red funny Dawn when we dig into this again. Red is amazing movie. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah, the film itself is like... It's it's the Goonies versus the Kremlin in regards to... It's, a bunch yeah. of, it's a bunch of teenagers. They're going to they're gonna set up, like, paint... Like, fucking Kevin McAllister... <laughs> paint on doors and stuff to take out squads of trained Spetsnaz soldiers. Like, oh, oh God. God. Uh, and you have, uh, what's his name? Oh, who, who, who was it? Was it, um, who was the one shouting avenge me? Who was their dad? Um, oh. Harry Dean Stanton, Harry Dean Stanton in like a, in like a work camp or something, shouting to his boys through the fence, avenge me. Oh <laughs> God. <laughs> Weird to think of seeing Harry D. Stanton in that because, like, whenever I think of him, I just think of him in like uh, David Lynch stuff. Just like play, he always plays a guy who owns like a junkyard. That seemed to be his. He is, yeah, he is the person. He well was he died? What he died? Yeah, he died a few uh, years ago. Years ago, yeah. Um, he was the personification of man who owns junkyard, <laughs> but not even like a mean junkyard guy. Just kind of like a guy of like. Hey, you kids trying to sneak into the junk? Oh, you can't be here after night. Oh, this uh, is my no, old dog, stuff, Rosie. The stuff comes out after night. You know, you gotta. Yeah, you gotta. Actually, was he? He was in the stuff, wasn't he? I was gonna say he's the guy who, like, unfortunately, <laughs> when the meteor falls in the junkyard, he's the first guy to get killed. Which is he's isn't Harry Dean Stanton? In, I was gonna say, isn't he an alien? He's not the uh, first guy is. to die in Alien, but he is the guy with a cat, right? Yes, he is an alien. I, I'm trying to remember uh, what his... Jonesy? Uh, well, no, Jonesy's the cat. Jonesy, but... No, Jonesy's the cat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know Jonesy's he's the, the guy cat. Who... 
he's the guy who owns Jonesy, and he's like, hey, Jonesy, where are you off to? Harry oh, Dean Stan's own. filmography has its own Wikipedia page. Wow. FYI. <laughs> yeah, because the guy was in like hundreds of films, right? He like he's one of those he's he's got the kind of the British acting mentality of it doesn't matter like if you're a professional, you'll do anything and you will like even if it's like schlock, you're still gonna commit to it like you would for like a Coen Brothers movie. Yeah. Which, you know, that's the way you gotta be with this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um John Milius we may have to touch into a little bit if we ever get to home front, because essentially it's Red Dawn, but North Korea, like they basically, THQ were like, let's hire this. What's going to appeal to the kids of today that like Halo Three? Let's get John Milius, who wrote this film from twenty <laughs> odd years ago called Red Dawn. See what he likes. And yeah, that's how we ended with Homefront. But um, <coughs> he, he also writes the um, uh, the Conan kind of the Barbarian adaptations as well, which have uh, Schwarzenegger in it. But right. So as a result, yeah, we kind of have this, like, big old film culture of, well, I guess even, like, arguably, like, Dirty Harry and stuff kind of engineers that back in the 70s where you have this. There's, it's like, it's a macho, like, the the good, the good white Might man, right. the good white yeah. man cop, or or it's like the good white man with a gun is mm. going to save the day. And very exactly. specifically, it's going to be a white dude because you're not mm. you're not you're not seeing a lot of movies outside of um a few specific Eddie Murphy uh vehicles. Oh yeah. That yeah, have like Beverly have Hills Cop and like 24 and 48 <clears throat> hours which are obviously and 48 like- hours. There's some um yeah and I think uh, I don't think Wesley Snipes is even into action movies at this point. No, um, like New Jack City was what ninety two or something. So he yeah. So you don't have a lot of it. yeah. You, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, black leads at this point playing the protagonist or the hero, um, with the exception of maybe um, it, that starts to change in the early nineties, right? You start to see oh, it course, flip a little yeah. bit. Um, you, you Predator Two. You swap out uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger oh, yeah. for Danny Glover. Yeah, Danny Glover, yeah, who very um, much is and like Danny Glover doesn't look like short. Like he is a average built. He's an old. I mean, he's older. This. I mean, this is after Lethal Weapon One. He's so he already. Is, he's already too old for this shit. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> and he's far too old for Predator. And yeah, I mean, obviously, the point of Predator Two is that it doesn't matter what your. I mean, that's. I mean, that's the point of Predator One, isn't it? Is that and again, it's kind of funny because you have films like Predator and like Robocop and stuff that comes out at the similar time, but these are very much like Which skewering. They things. skewer the idea that the masculinity is going to be what saves you. Um, exactly. Whereas, you know, uh, nobody was really ready for... Because, um, you know, you have Predator where, okay, the, the most macho of macho guys, they all, they all die basically in yeah. predator spoiler alert for predator there's only <laughs> one survivor um two survivors um because yeah. the other survivor he told to get to the chopper <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. um but the the thing about uh those movies is there the the media landscape was so thick with the the might makes right and it will mm. solve anything and maybe this one or and an exceptionalist american american exceptionalism like one american dude is going to come in and solve the problem so it's ripe for skewering that and that's what makes predator stand out uh yeah. that's what makes robocop as you said and also um uh robocop uh, the director of robocop uh, what's his name um verhoven verhoven Nobody was really ready for Verhoeven <laughs> when he was no, at his prime. I, uh, nobody was really, nobody really understood because I think RoboCop on a surface level reading, everybody's like, "Yeah, action movie," and we're like, "Oh, this is more. This is very much anti-capitalist, like oh, in its nature." <laughs> yeah, very much. It is that even after you, you can't die. After you die, you are just turned into a machine that has to just keep. They just. 
You become a cop and they just remove the humanity out of you. That is uh, literally. Yeah. Yes. Um, Yeah. I will say it's funny though, because I guess I don't know what, I mean, I guess kind of more the action films that you were into were maybe at the middle, kind of early to the middle of the nineties, because that would have been when you probably would have had more consciousness about it. But I guess at that point, Films like this had started to go a little bit out of fashion, right? Yeah, so... Yeah, I'd say films like this were very far removed. I don't think... I don't... There was... So, around 2000, you're you're getting the, the rise of the action comedy. Um, yes. So, so, when is, like... When are we getting, like, Rush Hour... Um, oh, Rush Hour was ninety eight. So ninety eight. So like, yeah, the the action comedy, the more like the Jackie Chan type stuff, where it's um, uh, Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker and and all that that stuff is 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 rising up um, in place of where the right wing ish um, co- uh, like action movie was. No, um, exactly. And I think Jackie Chan's kind of an interesting thing because he almost dovetails a little bit with right at the end of the this kind of action era. I mean, the weirdest thing was that we had all these films which were very much the concept of them was the person who is going to fix... Because, again, they're all set in, like, inner cities. All the gangs are multicultural. And then the heroes are very much old white guys. And the concept is essentially these are the people that should be in charge because they know what's correct. And that kind of, obviously, Reagan is president at that point. And so right. it's the two kind of shake hands. But then Clinton comes in as kind of almost a reaction to it, although obviously arguable with Yeah, that. and and you have to, the other thing is, like, even the person who is very associated, probably the director is most associated with action movies, um and spectacle action movies, uh, Michael Bay has already yes. moved away from the the cop or the the single individual action movie at this point because oh yeah, it, he his has, films become he did, pure he aesthetic. Did, he did Bad Boys in the Rock in the mid nineties, ninety five and ninety six. Bad Boys in the Rock, and I, you can really attach those to being like the tail end of this era, right? Bad boys being different and having black leads and the rock being a little bit different in terms of like, you have, well, I mean, you you, have Nicolas Cage as your lead, right? You have, you have Nicolas Cage who is, who, who is not an action guy at this point. No, he is, is more of a dorky type, uh, lead. He's raising, he's raising Arizona. He's raising Arizona. This is 1996. So you have, you have, and the right the the enemy are soldiers yeah. who are fighting who are want to to set off this the, because they've been used they they've yeah. been and their 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 motivation is they have been used by the United States to like kill people or whatever or something like that so it's like it's it's at, at the end of this era and like it it really has a twist twisted view on the heroics of it. And then Michael Bay is done with that kind of action movie because he moves on to, you know, disaster film with Armageddon. He moves on to a war movie uh, with Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, yeah. Um, And then he... The Transformers films. And then he does The Island, which is... Oh, yeah, yeah, which is a remake of... Right. It riffs on, you know, like, yeah, the prisoner and stuff like that. And then that. he's off on he's off on Transformers land for a long time. So, yeah, even the guy that you think of as the action director um, is not doing it. <laughs> no, and I, and I think it's very much just him and this just kind of new wave of almost kind of the Tarantino like people who have grown up in the V eight. Like, obviously, you have Scorsese and stuff back in the sixties and seventies who are all your first. These are the first wave of directors that come out of film school. So they're all film dorks. They're all so film have- dorks and they're used to looking behind. They're looking, they look, they look at themes and meaning and stuff like that. And then you, yeah, yeah. right. Tra- Tarantino and people like that come out of that. The, the VHS, VHS school. era, yeah. um, the VHS school where it's all style. It's like the style is the first thing and, yeah. and the substance is behind that. No, absolutely. And 
I think we have to say all of this in regards to, because the game that we're talking about is very much... We could dig into the actual politics of it, but like we kind of dig... Like we'll kind of talk a little bit about when we get a Wolfenstein. Raven Software aren't a particularly political developer, and this is a difficult thing to say because one... Inherently, everything's political. And two, we've done as much research as we can about Raven Software, but very much it's kind of like we can only really dig into interviews and kind of the surface level of that kind of stuff. So it could be the case that, no, Raven Software, when they make a game, they do have a particular message in mind with it. But the trend that we've seen across all these games, and especially this one, is that they're more interested in the aesthetics of stuff. They're very much like... Michael yeah. Bay, where on the surface their game may fit within kind of this old crank right wing style Death Wish template, but they're not really saying anything with it. It's it's more in the style of say Super Mario Brothers, where the fact that Super Mario is a plumber with kind of Italian American features and a name called Mario, that's not really and you know and he's saving a princess. Those are more just pieces that not really trying to say anything with it. It's more just kind of a sheen of thematics. That being said, though, this game does have a an actual political streak to it in regards to its big selling points, or at least the big selling point that it had at the time. But we'll get to that in a second, because just to kind of put a cap on Soldier of Fortune magazine, which is that blows up in popularity around the same time that these films and television uh, and, uh, you know, trends happened in the 80s because wars haven't been fought in a while. Capitalism has kind of created this on way of men feeling like I'm <clears throat> chewed out like a, little, like a piece of bubble gum because of my job. But people are telling me it's because it's not the 1950s anymore and I can't go out and hunt hey, my own no war food. For me. Yeah, there's no war yeah. for me to fight. <laughs> Exactly, and so you kind of have to relive this through consumption of media, essentially. But something like Soldier of Fortune, a magazine, that's like, th there's that sheen of reality to it because they are the stories of people who go and fight in Rhodesia and all these other conflicts across the world, and you can kind of live a little bit vicariously through that. Now, two funny stories that came out of my research about Soldier of Fortune magazine um, they get bit, getting taken to court for uh, things. Um, they got taken to court three times because in their classified section, they kept advertising for contract killers. It's pretty good. Okay. That's... As you would. Yep. Um, as you would. And then one of the other ones was that a <laughs> they, their, their parent company called Paladin Press published a book which was written by Social Fortune contributors called How to Be a Contract Killer. A Someone was taken <laughs> to court because somebody actually attempted to carry out a contract killing on three people using the advice from the book. <laughs> Fortunately, it fell through because the advice in the book wasn't written by a soldier but instead it was written by a housewife who imagined all of these details. Oh, well, there you go. So the magazine That's... itself plays a lot with, I guess you could argue, I guess the nicest way you say is that it's myth, it's mythologizing, it's myth making. It's that, yeah, you can go over and fight a war in Rhodesia, but you're literally just going through and killing people. But you can exaggerate that and make yourself to be out more like a, like a King Arthur style figure going out into the battlefield and fighting for what's right, I suppose. Yeah. But through that exaggeration, eventually facts and fiction just become completely blurred together, which. Yeah. Especially in reference to this game is quite an uh, interesting thing. Yeah. A lot of blurring happened for this game to be made. Mm -hmm. So, as you mentioned earlier, um, Activision, for some reason, has got the rights to Social Fortune magazine. I think probably, <laughs> maybe they must have had somebody in the company who 
whose brain hadn't moved on from the eighties and was like, "Oh, these actually, these these war stories are big at the moment. Let's uh, let's, let's well, social do that. fortune magazine. People are still reading that, right? Let's let's, uh, let's, let's get let's that do, license. Let's do social fortune magazine because people love." People loved uh, 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 Saving Private Ryan, and that's a war story. So let's let's crank out some more war stories. So stuff. that's the that's the weird thing is that like this predates the um, the kind of re uh, sort of the the reemergence and popularity of World War Two stuff following um, Saving Private Ryan in '99. This is more kind of like again following the end of world war ii and kind of as we go into vietnam and stuff and so yeah you have this complete schism of people who look at war as just kind of being as being scummy and then people who kind of embrace the scum of it because right. no one is a you're not fighting for a country or an ideal if you are it is literally in the title a soldier of fortune you were doing it to find fortune in the heat of battle Right. Um, the reason this game gets made, though, is that there is a TV series in 1998 and 99, also called Soldier of Fortune, based on the magazine. <laughs> and so Activision just must have saw that and said, well, perfect uh, t- TV tie-ins, that's what people like. And the interview that I found with um, Retro Gamer Magazine, um, some of the developers of uh, this game kind of make a point of saying that we didn't want this just to be a basic cash grab tie-in kind of game because i mean at this point we talk about it a little bit like in another episode where you have like you know you do have the disney snes games which are done by but actually have animators involved like aladdin and the lion king that sure sure are genuinely quite good but then right most film tie-ins or tv tie-ins usually suck pretty Pretty bad yeah so raven are making a point of saying no we are going to make a good tie-in for this when they make a start on the project though uh Activision said um well they say well if we want to make this as authentic as possible we don't just want to make a modern war game we need to have like we need to get the details right of all of this and that's where entering the scene is a is not only the character of this game, but the character of this podcast. John Mullins. John Mullins. <laughs> let's let's talk about... So here's a quote from Simon and Schuster, who have published his book. John F. Mullins joined the U.S. Army in 1960 and served three tours in Vietnam with the Special Forces, initially as a medic, and then as an A-team commanding officer and an SLG operative after being commissioned in 1964. After retiring in 1981, he has worked as a for-hire soldier, conducting security and anti-terrorism operations in such hotspots as Bogota, Colombia, Beirut, and Belfast. In 1990, Mr. Mullins founded Longbow Incorporated, a company that specializes in the manufacture of non-toxic frangible ammunition, Marketing this product, built upon his patent, to law enforcement and military customers through the United States <laughs> and the rest of the world. Um, he also founded a company called WCB and Associates, which specializes in the construction of tactical firing ranges and tr- and the training of uh, police military. So, hmm. John Mullins, which... John um, Mullins. Maybe when we do the video version of this, I'll actually post a picture of the guy, and I'll also post the video of him doing an interview for Soldier of Fortune 2, where we're doing this cool solace name voice for him, but you watch it and he goes, All right, my name's John Mullins. Uh, you'll be playing as me in Soldier of Fortune 2. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's his real voice, and in the game, his his voice is, oh, yeah. is, basically, <laughs> is basically Solid Snake. Like... <laughs> It'd be better if in the game it was um, it was his actual voice. Um, and hey, I'm gonna kill these guys, and we're gonna. John, go we got we, the 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 station's full of terrorists. You got it. Okay, I'll go in okay, there. I'll I'll show them I'll see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe any. Like maybe he's done some of this stuff. Maybe he hasn't. Who knows? 
I'm gonna say if he was. I'm gonna say it's it, like ninety percent, ninety nine percent no, and one percent he was uh, in Bogota once on vacation or something. Oh yeah, no, he was in a. He probably sat in a chair while they were all talking about like. Uh, um, should we spend money on getting these lasers? What was he doing sites? in Belfast? What was he- yeah the be- yeah that's what I mean. If he was over in Belfast, if he, that one percent is correct, yeah, guy's a scumbag. I'm just gonna I'm just is gonna he, say is that he much. is he uh, is, like who is he fighting in Belfast? I, I would, he, which side I, is he fighting for? You I'm don't know. going to imagine as an as a an American soldier, he was probably contracted by the British to probably probably the Crown. Yeah. Yeah, probably for the crown, I would imagine. So. Yeah. John Mullins. John Mullins. He John. reported directly he reported directly to to Queen Elizabeth the second on about like like I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep you Northern Ireland is gonna be yours. And I'm gonna John, get the rest of a, Ireland too. There's there's a nuclear warhead in Blarney Castle. You have to you'll have to dismantle it. Oh, I got it, Liz. You, Liz. <laughs> I got it for you, Liz. I, I'm sorry, I mean, you're all ready for a few, Liz. Don't worry. I'll, I'm going to load up. Um, so, uh, just a quote from... Um, <laughs> uh, from the developers of uh, Social Fortune. Basically, they say, what really solidified it and gave us some direction was when we found out about John Mullins. So, he came in and basically gave some like he told him this is what kind of the action should feel like this is you know how the gun should be modeled here's how it would be hold stuff like that but he also contributed some story ideas based on things that he had actually done which if he (laughs) so he went down in the subway and he shot a lot of people that happens. Okay, so the first mission of uh, the first mission of Social Fortune a game that uh, a game that came out in the year 2000 for the PC. It's literally uh, Death came- Wish. <laughs> it also came out on the PS2, which is how I played it. Um, it. The port was done by Pipe Dream Interactive, and I will say, really solid port of the game. Um, it has completely customizable controls in it. It also has the most ridiculous amounts of aim assist that you could possibly want. So... This is kind of, again, this is, I mean, 2000 is kind of a funny era as well, because even though yeah. you did have shooters on the N64 and the PS1, this is where they have decided to kind of make the Quake engine and um, eventually Unreal work on these consoles. And so it's very much like, we want to give the people at home the PC experience on a console. And so right. some people have gone, well, you know, we'll give you, like, kind of Spartan options and kind of fuck you for not having a mouse. Or some right. people went the opposite direction and said, let's give you all the bells and whistles that you could possibly want to fiddle around with this to the extent that you can change, you know, what your what buttons you use for turning, for looking up and down, for straight and left and right, all that kind of stuff. But this also has aim assist, which is something that even modern FPS games have to the point that they're usually pretty good that you don't really notice it. Right, uh, some that just helps you correct, um, you know, aiming on a joystick because it's not that accurate. It's, right. This lets you have it; you can turn that off completely, which is how I played most of it, and I felt it felt pretty good for me. I didn't really need it because yeah, that's good. It, it's a quake game. It's um, the enemies aren't super sophisticated, you know. Just as get in the area. Have, yeah, <laughs> if you hit in the area, it's fine. Then you can have, like, soft aim assist, which is kind of, if it's near enough to an enemy, or just snap over it and help you line it up. It has horizontal and vertical aim assist, which will just snap it to whatever axis these enemies are on, and then it's your job to line it up. And then it has extreme aim assist. And I played the game for a little bit with it, and we were talking about Robocop earlier, and... Yeah. Oh boy, if you wanted to <laughs> live the right wing action movie fantasy <coughs> of something like a uh like a Chuck Norris film, that's how you should play Soldier of Fortune because literally yeah. it is like the virtual cop demo on an arcade machine where the moment that an enemy appears, it you snaps just snap to onto, it. Yeah. It's just and all you just need to do is pull the trigger and that is it. It is amazing. Oh, that's great. It's something that I wish, because obviously now console games are a bit more, especially after Halo, they're a bit more right. figured out. 
I wish I wish games still had like an extreme aim assist option. Oh god, just for, yeah, like, that would be that would be so much fun. Just chill, mo- like let's just have it so you turn your game into a light mode. gun shooter. Yeah, yeah. just He's chill so mode. Good. Chill yeah, mode. The, yeah, yeah. That's actually the easy the 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 easiest difficulty is um, it goes easy and then I think there's one more below it called like very uh, easy or something. It, it's it, it's just it's. Um, it's it's like super duper easy or something like that, and basically the bullets do no damage to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you um, it's one of those games where they were trying to figure out as well how can we make this more difficult beyond just shots do more damage and enemies might be more intelligent. This game has limited quick saving and saving in general in it, which I think is bizarre. Yeah, as a as a difficulty th- again. This is the only game they're still trying to figure this out. And, like, most of the inspiration for this game, and this is where I think this is kind of a weird outlier from a lot of other Raven, of Raven stuff, beyond just the fact that it is an action game starring a guy called John Mullins, and it's there's no magic in this game. The game is fantasy in regards to what you do in it, but there is no, like, magical elements to it. But... Right. Rather than taking off to Doom and Quake, which after this they go back and they do, um, they'll do Star Trek Elite Forces and then they'll do the two Star Wars games, which very much feel like Dark Forces, which felt like Doom. It's Doom, but in a Star Wars skin. This has a totally different feel to its combat, which. Right. Again, getting into it, first level is literally Death Wish. You are <laughs> fucking. You're, far, Charles, you're Charles Bronson. Bronson. Yeah, you're Charles Bronsoning through a subway, shooting you're skinheads. Li- you're contacted because the <laughs> because the New York police force are so inept to be able to take out this Nazi skinhead gang that have taken over a subway station that they have contacted Soldier of Fortune, retired John Mullins, uh, John Mullins retired army guy, and oh god, how he looks in the game is amazing <clears> because like. You have like cops, and they look like they look like cops from a Spider-Man game. That's just kind of blocky, and you know, yeah, all they blue. were in the blue and all that. And then he has his best friend, which is so again, Hawk? like th- they brought John Mullins in to be a consultant and be like, we want to make this as realistic as possible. But Hawk looks like an action figure. He lo- he looks like Barrett from Final Fantasy. He looks VII. like he looks like um Michael Clark Duncan was given the Bane serum. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like Michael D- Clark Duncan was hired to play like Action Jackson from the Dexter's Lab cartoon. He is wearing a a combat vest a, a, a khaki vest and like combat shorts <laughs> with a single like bandolier across his chest and nothing else giant bare arms sunglasses <laughs> on he like again he looks like barrett from ff7 <laughs> and then you have john mullins who looks like dehydrated captain price from modern warfare <laughs> to He's the just extent got his that, mustache like, yeah that's the thing his defining feature is that he has a big old guy's mustache but and kind of well, again, like this is an early Quake game, so like all the facial detail is done through texture. So he looks right. like Max Payne. He's just like constantly yeah, there's just a face, through it. Yeah, a face yeah. pasted on there. Um, but you go down into the subway, and basically your your mission isn't to negotiate with these guys to find out why they're there. No, your job is to go in there, minimize as many hostage damages as you can. That is one thing, but just minimize them out. you don't Fucking need to just, it's it's not like and it's 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 minimize it's not zero <laughs> yeah it is minimize that that they're, they're, they're expecting they're like no it's john mullins he's gonna kill some people but he's gonna he he's gonna see everyone. someone and accidentally shoot them that's we we can we can assume that he's a bull in a shot <laughs> we've literally given him a giant hand cannon to go down here so we're we have to blame ourselves really for doing this right uh so you go down there and you start to, you just blow away as many skin heads as possible. And this is where I started to warm up to, <laughs> to the game. <laughs> because the action in it is, oh, I quite like the feeling of shooting <coughs> in yeah, this. Yeah, 
yeah. Um, it feels good to play. It's it's yeah. weird, but um, the guns. Um, one of the things I appreciate about the guns is how he holds them, how he takes them out, how yes. he loads them, because it's very. It feels very tactile. Um, yes. He, he like he takes his shotgun out and he like does this like flip thing in his hands. Oh yeah, the little flip thing he does, I think, is really to, cute. And and like the way he um the way he like reloads his submachine uh, gun, like normally it would be like the gun hand and like you'd see the gun hand come up and then like the off hand do the reloading. <laughs> Yeah. He he tosses it to his offhand and he does it like real quick with his gun hand and then like flips it back. It's yeah. there's like a lot of neat little details. Yeah, uh, it is. It is. It does feel like playing a guy who is like an experienced soldier because again, not just in the again, it's kind of the Batman Arkham Asylum thing of like they do simplify a lot of stuff, but it's all in the animations where you see the complexity. Right. It's meant to put you in the shoes of somebody who is very good at what he is doing it's, to the extent it, it would feel effortless it's sort of like when you watch the behind the scenes on like john wick or something like yes. that where somebody is like points pauses to point out like okay the way he's reloading his gun here is like a is like a very specific tactical way that people are trained to reload in this certain type of specific situation and i'm like there is a lot of there's a lot of attention to detail in those John Wick movies um, about like handling of guns. That is something that um, you can kind of see in a game like Soldier of Fortune. You know, 15 years before John Wick even comes out. Now, yeah, I I, I cannot you know comment on how accurate all of it is, but it is different than what other shooters are doing. It feels a bit more legitimate versus something like Doom, which, again, right. I think is, again, this doesn't feel like anything that Raven has done before, where not only did they not have guns where they didn't reload properly, their games didn't have guns. They were basically doing, quote-unquote, magic shooters, where you have, sure. like, a guy's hand shooting out thunderbolts or he's hitting with a big mace or something like that. So from going from that, to this where you have these gun models which is not quite black like um the criterion game where it's you know all the details are there and like the niceness of the animations but yeah the fact that it has these little details to it of a guy who yeah might have he might have just said to them like oh yeah you know sometimes when i'm going through i'll you know i'll flip the shotgun or like you know i'll Oh no! If you're if you're exper- like if you re- they teach you to reload it this way, but when you eventually get good enough, you just like you flip it around and just throw it back in because it's just incredibly effortless. And again, right? I think that kind of leads into the whole. It feels it doesn't feel like a military action game, but it feels more like a Hollywood military like game, yeah. which is. It's interesting that they did bring Mullins as as a consultant, because usually when you do that, it's to give something an air of authenticity, like you would do with, say, Call of Duty, where, you know, you bring those soldiers in and you ask them, you know, what were your experiences with World War II? And it's how you end up with something like the D-Day landing sequence, again, in Saving Private Ryan, where it's so incredibly visceral, because it was like, yeah, that's how I remember this. Right. This is this, where it's like, well, what are all the things that we like about what a gun can do? We like that they're loud. We like that they're made out of metal and have all these moving parts. Mm-hmm. We like that you can shoot them, like you can lean and shoot around corners and stuff. Right. And so in that respect, like the game does... It does a lot of that stuff. And I think it's interesting considering the fact that they'll eventually become the Call of Duty DLC guys, but also... Yeah, lead, that is, it is interesting. Camp- yeah. And lead the campaign on COD Cold War, which is very much you play as a snotty, shitty mercenary in the 1980s, reporting directly to Ronald Reagan. Yeah, basically John Mullins. Basically, yeah. I wonder, because <laughs> I, I haven't played Black Ops, I wonder if John Mullins is in it. John Mullins. I think it's. I, John Mullins. Yeah, I think that's worth play, uh, worth a play through, just to see if there's a there's a dude with a mustache I think like, if, yeah, I think if this, uh, if we ever expand on the Raven series at any point, 
that would be one of the games I'd like to give a go. We'll have is... to go into the the call of, call of Raven. Um, the Call of Raven stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, but just to say, like, because we keep referring to the fact that, like, yeah, the guy is a military consultant and they brought him in for authenticity purposes, but in this game, you diffuse four nuclear warheads. You you travel across the world to all these different places and are able to diffuse four of them. In one of these cases... You go to a James Bond Moonraker-style snow base in the middle of the Russian Arctic, which is full mm -hmm. of science fiction energy devices and the like, and you're just able to take it out completely on your own. Um, you go to Tokyo to a high-rise building there and fight ninjas. Um, you get a microwave gun at some point that you can use to blow people up. And then the final boss of the game is a guy called Dakar, who looks exactly like Grey Fox from He's Metal Gear Solid Fox. One. He is a cy he is a Russian cyborg guy, and you blow him up in a room with a submarine in it. Yep. This was all stuff that John Mullins said. He did it all. He did <laughs> yeah, John Mullins. We can only assume that John Mullins did all this stuff to the... Because otherwise, why would they put it in the game? They were aiming for military realism with it. John so, Mullins like, was actually Fox Die. He, he was... <laughs> it wasn't actually, a, it wasn't actually a, something that... He was the one that actually went and killed... Uh, I love the idea that, like, they're in the office and that, like, that he t gives them the, the concept of Grey Fox and it's just like, isn't that just MGS1? And he goes, you're actually MGS1. I did that. That game was me. about that was that was a game about me. I oh, everything that happened in that game was like me. Hide, Hideo Kojima is actually uh, uh, yeah. Snake is based on John Mullins. He's a huge John Mullins fan. <laughs> like all of, like John Mullins is cloned from the original John Mullins, who was a soldier in the 1960s. Yeah, yeah. It goes. It goes. Uh, John Mullins, uh, Big Boss, and then Liquid and Mullins. Then Liquid Mullins. <laughs> <laughs> solid this is, is Mullins. This is this is big big Mullins and liquid Mullins and solid Mullins. <laughs> God, I wish MGS five if they had hired um what's his face? Uh he's the guy from twenty uh if they had, had Kiefer playing John Mullins, that would have been great. Oh yeah, that would have been great. God. But um one thing that we haven't touched on yet, which I was going to say in regards to when you go down to the subway and you're blowing away um, skinheads. Yeah. So the big selling point of this game, or the big kind of reason to buy it at the time, was that it had state-of-the-art gore. It had a something that they had basically... This is the Quake 2 engine two, at this Yeah, point. Quake 2, yeah. This is the Quake 2 engine, but they have developed a system called Ghoul, G-H-O-U-L, which is their really elaborate gore system and the reason that this is is that they essentially break down character models into separate sexes heads and arms and whatever mm -hmm. and the intent is that when you play you don't just have to shoot center masses well basically in doom and like all these games pretty much beforehand you just shot center mass until they fell over Okay, eventually we then get into the era of having, like, headshots specifically doing more damage, like in uh, Goldeneye. And even then, Goldeneye is kind of like a precursor to this in regards to you can shoot people in the hands and, like, they're out there, or shoot them in the leg and they fall over. This takes it another level, though, that you can disable, like, parts of people's body. And by disable, I mean blow them off completely. Blow them off. Like the, Just right, like, right, like big old chunk. Um, and... Again, you can use this tactically in regards to you can shoot out people's hands so they can no longer use guns or blow off their legs so they can no longer move. But it's not really... Uh, I think maybe you could argue the intent is, well, it's tactical. I got to save my bullets, so I'm just going to like make them fall over. No, it's spectacle like the it's reason that this it's 100 percent spectacle it's that you're a 14 year old boy who loves heavy metal and you invite your friend over and you say dude look at this check out check out this game and you shoot a terrorist in the head and it blows up into a million pieces and it is rad <laughs> it is rad 
It is pretty bad. I will say this much though. Uh, in in the year 2022, it is actually no. I was going to say it's not as gory as it used to be, but now it's kind of evolved into this. It's kind of uncanny in a horror. Like it's not yeah. nice. Yeah. Um. It's it's weird because this is like so the Soldier of Fortune gore is like it's it's almost it's cartoonish. You know, it's like oh yeah. my god, the head blew up. The the arm flew off or whatever. Um, there's what we get these days is a little bit different than, than no. That. Like if you shoot a guy in the head in like Call of Duty, they just flump immediately. Most games now, if you shot somebody in the arm or the leg, you don't even really get a lot of reaction stuff. It's mostly it's gone yeah. kind of back to the Doom stuff. If you just shoot center mass and they fall over. Here though, they really like yeah. Not pay well, the, attention, but they, they milk it, don't they? They milk it. There's a, there's one point where I shot a guy in the foot, and he just hopped around grabbing his foot for, like, minutes. He's like, I ah, shot, ah, well, that's the thing. Ah. I shot a guy in the arm, and he's this, like, African soldier. Oh, yeah, you got you to... Gotta, uh, all the places that America didn't like in the uh, late 80s, you know, he's, oh, yeah, you go to all those places. And you go to all chaos. those places. It's- I'm sure if they had an expansion pack, you would have went to Belfast as well. But no, you just go to, <laughs> you go to Africa, you go to Russia, you go to Vietnam. Or, oh, and oh, yeah, and I forgot, you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to, you go to Iran. And, and when you go there, the it's like a fucking Wolfenstein level. Not just in how it's designed in regards to it's just tunnels. But there's just enormous posters of Saddam Hussein's head everywhere, like Hitler in <laughs> War 3D. And when that happened, I was like, oh, yeah, this is like throwbacky. This is like this. It's them saying, oh, well, he's the Hitler of our days, Saddam Hussein. And yeah, I was like, oh, clearly. Okay, well, that'll be, that'll be the end of that. And then you get a cut scene where you actually get to meet Saddam Hussein, who is rinsing out a guy that you're looking for. And then John Mullen turns up and says, all right, Saddam, I don't want to put a bullet in your head, so hand the guy over. And Saddam, understanding that John Mullins is a complete badass. It's John guess, Mullins. Yeah. Okay, he's yours. Go ahead, John Mullins. Leave me alone. And so, yeah, John Mullins is so cool that he's able to spook uh, Saddam Hussein uh, into handing people over. Uh, of course. Of course. Uh, but, God, what was I saying? Yeah, you shoot, like... I shot a guy in the arm, and he's, like, screaming, crying. And it's like, oh, this is, like, this is odd. Like, this isn't, like, this This isn't, like, a, oh, you hit me, kind of. You know, it's not like Virtual Cop, where they just let out a big comical grunt or whatever. Or, like, right. Doom, where it's, like, monster noises. No, this just, I don't know where the hell they got the sound samples for this stuff from. It just does sound genuinely quite upsetting. It does. It's, and when it's you very combine upsetting. that... When you combine it with these awkward facsimiles of humans made in the Quake 2 engine, it, it would be like cutting open a gingerbread man and finding out that he has, like, an actual skeleton, a nervous system in there, and it's like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> it reminded me of, there was this arcade game that I will never be able to get out of my head, which was made in the 80s called, like, Chiller, which uh-huh. then got, like, a, it got an unauthorized NES port. But it oh, is, like... Yes. It's Killer. like bit like it's like bitmap kind of Commodore style graphics of humans where it almost it almost reminds me a bit of um Faith, the you know, the Faith trilogy where it's yes. like yes. they look like the outlines of human beings, but they're like a solid colour. But like the whole point of Chiller is, is that you have people in like torture acts and stuff, but the game is you're blasting their body parts off and they come off and not realistic detail but there's like an awkward kind of like middle ground between it still looks like an arm yeah but yeah and so like you're just looking at it it's like it's, oh God, it's this pretty is... grotesque yeah like and because and again combined with the fact that it had an unauthorized nes port and there's like barely any information about the developer who made it it's like it feels like a kind of a creepy pasta thing like oh my god did like is this game haunted? Are these, like, real people in an NES game sort of right. thing? Right, right, right. And Social Fortune kind of has the bit of that feeling where it's, like, again, it's the raven ambitiousness of going above and beyond with this weird system that they've built, but to the point that it becomes almost awkward, where 
yeah, you can blow a guy's hand off and his hand originally looked like a mitten, which was textured with fingers. Right. But then it has a little polygon bone stump <laughs> where it used to be. And yeah, it's I know like that a, my... It's like when you kill somebody in a, in Among Us and it's just like a single bone sticking out of the body. Yeah, exa- <laughs> yeah exactly right. But yeah, it's just... It's just <laughs> bizarre and it's like and so going through this game and like and and it's funny because like initially when you have the pistol and stuff it only does like kind of penetrating damage so again it's like oh oh and then they fall over but the moment you get the shotgun it is like it's the complete opposite ethos to doom where it's like yeah you get the shotgun and yeah 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 this game kicks ass Or, or like black where you get the shotgun and you can blow doors off hinges and you realize Oh, this is a powerful weapon. Yeah. You get the shotgun in this and it blows people's limbs off and they start crying and you go, Oh f- fucking what have hell, I what is- done? <laughs> yeah, what the hell is this? And so what? John Mullins just being there and going, Yeah, um, I Sherlock I, I I blew guy's arms whole off like a Tarantino film, but then they like cried like children and I didn't right. really know what to do. And Raven Suffer being like, Yo, that's badass. We gotta put Yo, that, that in the we, game. We gotta put that in the game. Get somebody you know, in the Foley booth crying about their their <laughs> lost arm. I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna go into the Foley booth and tell this guy that his wife died in a car accident and got the best <laughs> Foley out of it. We're gonna squeeze some some real good Foley out of this. We're gonna bring his grandma in and put a gun to her head, and then that's how we we'll get good Foley out of him. But to the extent that um, that was kind of the big controversial. I mean, obviously, it's one of those... It was like the original Grand Theft Auto where the controversy helped with sales a lot because everyone was talking about, like, the gore system that Soldier of Fortune had at the time. Despite the fact that 20, 22 years after the fact, I don't think anyone remembers what Soldier of Fortune, like, was. But no. this came out year after Columbine year before 9-11, so, like, the discussion around violent, depictions of violence in games are, like, it's right this is, there. like, it is at an all-time high, because coming off of Doom and Night Trap and stuff, and then right. they keep pushing it and pushing right. it until eventually what happens happens, and they decide to, you know, let's, we've kind of, we kind of pushed the ball a little bit too much on this. Yeah. But their whole thing for this was that well, again, like, there's interviews with Raven staff members now where they go, oh, it was overblown. Like, people just made, a like, a mountain out of mohel out of this whole thing. But I think Activision were very much, like, banking on the fact of... I mean, again, they wanted to buy it, like, for to make games for them. And I right. think maybe they wanted to be the slightly <clears throat> edgier, you know, we're going to push the boundaries publisher. And right. so something like Soldier of Fortune... And again, the argument can be made of the reason that we have this level of intense gore is because it's more realistic. Yeah. Even it's more though realistic. Even though Again, <clears throat> you play the game and it's as realistic as fucking Kill Bill, where people's yeah. hands get cut off and guys are blood <laughs> just spraying spray blood everywhere. Yeah, it's yeah, because like if you if you're looking at like even a game like uh Sniper Elite, Sniper Elite yes. Five, for example doesn't even necessarily it's it's quote unquote like gory it doesn't even go to the the, some of the weird levels that this does i mean it does do the it does do the x-ray shots which are just like um i think do a better job of like showing you oh that's fucked up because it yeah. like it like does an X-ray and it shows like all the damage a bullet does as it's going through somebody rips apart muscle and blows <laughs> apart like blood vessels and stuff. Yeah, um, it's like Mortal. Co- it's like Mortal Kombat Nine. It's like Mortal Kombat. The- yeah. yeah, yeah. But you punch somebody in the head and you actually see like their skull shatter apart. It's like oh fucking hell, that is intense. Yeah, and I think like as those games, I mean that is the bizarre thing of like Mortal Kombat. It's still like even though it was like. I think I said this is like a clue for one of the um, um, the top fives that we did, where it was like this was the franchise that was big in the nineties. No, th- but the series is still going, and not only is it still going, but they're still they push the envelope on how good the graphics look in that game. But to the extent that like the X ray shots and fatalities are quite are can are quite like genuinely stomach churning. They are, yeah. 
it, it's I'm tough to, to say, watch. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not saying this because I'm a big, you know, pansy, even though the beginning of this podcast should make it out that I am the biggest pansy because I watch, I watch 80s action films starring Charles Bronson and go, oh, but I don't think if he just talks to them. Why didn't he just find out why they're in this situation? Why didn't he help out in the community rather than just blowing people away with a fucking revolver? Because that's not how Charles Bronson solves problems. <laughs> No, exactly, and that's not, and it's also not a very entertaining film. It's not a very entertaining film, it's necessarily. Realistic it's death totally wish. Totally different, yeah, realistic, or like, or uh, empathetic death wish, like, empathetic let's, death let's wish. figure out why these situations, let's look at the systemic issues that cause these problems, and be like, yeah, yeah the systemic issue, there's not enough, uh, you know, there's not enough good people with guns is the, that's, yeah, exactly. that's the, not enough, like taking the exact wrong lesson out of it. There's not enough old white dudes with the biggest guns possible making a difference in the community. And if there were, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe your Charles maybe Bronson's nice family parts. would still be alive. <laughs> I guess. So, yeah. Um, and I guess like, so is your fortune, but that's the thing. The game is again isn't really apart from that first mission, which is skinheads on the subway, and then the follow up mission where you find okay. So here's the not to ruin Souls of Fortune for you folks, but when I originally when I initially played it, I went okay. This beginning mission has nothing to do with the rest of the game. No, it does because that those Nazi skinheads, one of them is the brother of Gray Fox, and his whole uh-huh. thing was a ruse. To take you take your attention away from the fact that they've stolen a bunch of nuclear warheads, and so trying to capture them and like track them down again, you're able to get more information about where to find the guy who stole the warheads in the first place. You so, know what I really love about the game is, you, yeah, you, where you f- get your missions from is you go to like a a bookstore, magazine store, yeah, and you, you like you, you ask for a certain back issue of Soldier of Fortune magazine. Uh, Soldier of Fortune magazine, March 1989, or something like that. Yeah. And this guy who looks like John Goodman's character from The Big Lebowski. Yeah, uh, he looks like um, Dennis Hopper's character in Easy Rider, which is... He, I gotta imagine, is that like an... Is that like a... Both that character and the one from The Big Lebowski, are they based on like a... They must be based on like a real guy. In I think they're just based they on like a more of a general like former Vietnam vet. Farm, yeah, former Vietnam green jacket, kind yeah. of hippie-ish. Yeah, I fought <clears throat> over in the war, man. Kind of yeah, thing. Right. Um, he also looks a bit like Gabe Newell in a weird way. A little bit. Guy who gives you, who a gives you bit. the missions. He looks like Gabe Newell with the big beard and the glasses. So he takes you back to a, like a, a room that's like, you know, high tech and everything. And they, mm. they give you, you get your mission. And that's to, that's to save the world from uh from nuclear weapons and then you're like there's also there's like you're on a train on one mission and you're on it's it's wild it's wild stuff they do that's what i mean and i think the thing that i like about it as well is that i've played when we played black for a previous episode of the podcast the things that i really liked about that game was when they did cqc like close quarters shooting stuff and the stuff I didn't like was when you had snipers alleys and like wide open levels because it didn't really play very well with the shooting. For the most part, this is all uh, close quarters. This is all like tight corridors and stuff. It's all about, you know, peeking around corners, slicing the pie, you know, all the cool things about like close quarters combat, which again, right. as much as I kind of should hate this game from an ideological standpoint, I kind of like the game a lot from a <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun. Game I mean, play gameplay yeah. like the level design is is varied from level to level. Yeah. Um and there's it's always getting to the end of the level is always weird because you're always like you're always like in a room and then you kill a couple guys and it just kind of like fades to black. And we're like, "Oh, I guess that was the I guess that was the end of the level." <laughs> yeah, I guess that was it. I walked it no, that's the funny thing as well, is that you'll walk into an area that triggers the end of... You, like, you don't walk through a door and it's like Hex and 2 and it warps you to a different level. It's You walk into a room and then it just slowly fades to black and it's like, oh, okay, maybe I finished the level. Or maybe John Mullins is falling asleep. I don't maybe know. Maybe he's do- he would doze off occasionally. He, he, after, he runs out it, of energy. He would get tuckered out from killing so many people. He would just have to stop and take a nap. 
Yeah. Uh, just to quickly note, I also gave the multiplayer a quick try, but oh. with bots. Um, okay. This was on the PS2 version. I think the PC version does have multiplayer, but it is player versus player, which I doubt you can probably get. I imagine there might be some server support, but... I mean, I, I, I'm, I bet John Mullen still has it running, you know? <laughs> I think he's... I think he's sitting there by like just sitting at his computer at his house, just staring, waiting for somebody to join his match. I was going to say the, the game doesn't actually have bots. They were just John. Like that's just what Mullins does nowadays. He just controls all these different characters yeah. just very easily. Um, it's okay though. Uh, again, like just the sort of none of it's mostly they just built a bunch of maps for it, which were kind of based on a bit of the arena design that they have later on in the game. So nice amount of verticality you have a couple of gimmicky ones like oh we didn't talk about the meat processing plant which again leans very hard on the racist depictions of people who aren't john mullins where you have like yeah just tall brown guys in dirty overalls just screaming at you and it's like okay, yeah cool. yeah if you're not uh, yeah it's the game is <laughs> Makes a lot of questionable <laughs> yeah. choices and... yeah the game is uh, and again is it the raven software thing of well, these films have these kind of enemies in it. I yeah, guess the, the Raven our, software our thing game has to have it as well. Just Let's kind of washing their anything. hands of, and that was yeah. that was very common. In like the the in game design is like, yeah, we're just gonna wash our hands of the thought that it, that it's political, and it's just like it's, it's just a style piece. Yeah, it's a style piece. It's just media, and uh, there's no such thing as just media. Um, no, of but course. yeah, it's so in short. Yes, the game is right wing crank pop propaganda, but it's kind of fun to play right wing crank pop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was gonna say, like, the meat processing plant is full of conveyors, and that's a fun little thing is that you have little bits of conveyor um, action, you know, jumping from bit to bit and you know whatever. And they do a lot. Like, yeah, you have a train level which is fun. You have a uh, you go to Iran and it's like all these kind of like broken down buildings. And again, it's kind of a hex and two thing of figuring out the way ahead where all the rubble is but it works it's really pretty solid and so the game is a fun like i will say even though it is old having a ps2 version i think has helps it in a lot of ways because the control scheme can be tweaked a lot and it just it runs at 60 frames per second doesn't it looks like a solid quake 2 game don't expect don't go, why don't they look like real human beings? It's like, nobody looked like a real human being in this yeah, game. It's, games at this point. Go in with certain expectations and you'll be fine. Yeah, it is a fun little time. And again, the multiplayer isn't bad either, but it's not anything particularly exceptional. It is a Quake-style multiplayer game, which right. probably the game that we'll talk about in the episode after this one, we may dig a little bit more into it because of the time that it came out. But all in all, yeah... Soldier of Fortune, when when I initially played it and when we were initially talking about it, I thought I was going to be a lot meaner on it. But that was more from what it kind of represented. But I think after playing Wolfenstein 09, I've just sort of softened in regards to when you take Raven as a whole, they're D&D &D nerds. They like playing with tropes and yep. fantasy elements. This is like if you were this running is... a Black Ops D, D like a Black Ops set D and D campaign. Yeah, like very true. All the tropes. Yeah, but they don't really dig into the, the kind of the yeah. They're, they're yeah. They don't. They don't really want to deal with the ideology of it. They purely want it as aesthetic, which right has aged the game beyond belief in that respect. Yes. <laughs> when you take, but if you treat it the same way that you would like, say. You know, on like uh, Red Letter Media's Best of the Worst, where they watch like these films from like you know the, like the, the Death Wish films and stuff, they take them purely as camp value at this. Yeah, point. And yeah. I think you can you could do the same for this. It's not you can as... choose to engage with it on a you can choose to engage with it on a level beyond what, and that's va and that's valuable um, and valid because it's good for media criticism and all that stuff. But the recommended way to engage with it is uh, avoid um, thinking too much about it because I guarantee the developers didn't. It is very, it, it, yeah, but it is very em emblematic and it does kind of stand out as like, oh, wow, yeah, a lot of people weren't 
um, a lot of creatives uh, creating popular media weren't thinking about maybe the damage that some of the tropes yes. that they were leaning on were doing. Um, and that is a greater, that that's more, that's like more, this is a product of like a very big systemic issue of uh, like white people creating media and not thinking about it. Um, yeah, too much. and kind of, and maybe just the military industrial complex in regards to. Yeah, exactly. Like the Marvel films are full of the military, but we never really go beyond just pure right. aesthetic. Meanwhile, Michael Bay does exactly the same thing, but because it is camp, like high camp, it's kind of... It's kind of past. It's like, oh, yeah, it's Yes, a pass, yeah. Uh, I would just kind of say it's kind of a nice wrap-up point with that. So, again, from this um, uh, retro gamer interview, how it was summed up was, we wanted players to feel like they were the heroes of a movie. We had grown up with stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Chuck Norris, and Clint Eastwood. We'd see them be the one-man army that saves the day and takes out the bad guy in whatever way they had to. Everything was rooted in the idea of the action movie hero. We kept the movement reasonably fast, the weapons powerful and deadly, and the enemy's interaction said that there was a small pacing break, but not at the cost of the action movie speed and adrenaline ramp. And I think in that respect, the game, they they do, the game is a success in that regard. Like It is, yeah. It does that. <laughs> it is It is the horrible... I mean, this is the schism of especially the games that we're covering, which is, yeah, their politics are fucked, but that comes at the cost of the gameplay has to be a certain way. You have to, be, you have to feel like a one-man army. You have to go through and right. blow people apart. And again, I think that's very kind of indicative in, like, John Milius... Not only did he write Red Dawn, but he also wrote the Conan the Barbarian films. They both deal in the same thing of big male power fantasy, which you watch that in a film and you're able to dig into it a little bit more because there is that disc in it. But when you play it, it's awkward because it is those games. Ga those games are really fun. They are crowd pleasers as a result, and. Not to say that, you know, things lead into other things. I'm not right. saying that, like, games like this, have, you know, are responsible for the actions of certain individuals because there is always much more to it. But yeah, I do think it is something that modern games have kind of started to reckon with a little bit. And I think in a... I don't think to the extent, though, that we no longer have FPS games because that isn't true. I mean, right. Fortnite <laughs> is, like, the biggest game on Earth and it is a game aimed squarely at children, but the what you do is you shoot other people, but right. it almost kind of feels what, like we're at a level of savviness now where... You can design it in a way that's like, okay, it's arcadey, you know, and it's it's not that serious, you know, it's not... It, yeah. It, it, it kind of... It's not like... There's a reason why uh, of the two Battle Royales that came out in the same... That time PUBG, there's yeah. pub that and PUBG and PUBG had that vague real realism and port and Fortnite is bright and bold and cartoony and arcadey. There's a reason why Fortnite won ultimately, uh, 100%. <laughs> and not just the fact that they were able to add Spider Man and Naruto and stuff to it every. Well, single I think week. it's it's also um, like feeling as like I think parents were a little bit more like they look at Fortnite and they're like, oh yeah, that's fine. What I you know, they the kids can play that. That's fine. That's it's that's a yeah. very pretend game. Whereas PUBG would be like, eh. <laughs> and I guess something like Soldier of Fortune very much is aimed at like. Again, it's like Grand Theft Auto One. It's aimed the game at your parents don't want you to buy. Yeah, yeah, Soldier it's very Fortune. much aimed at like fourteen-year-olds who didn't yeah. know any better. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and funnily enough with that, which is a nice segue to the last part of this podcast, which is, so you know how last week we weren't particularly hot on Hexen and mm. we were like, uh, you know, and it didn't sell very well, but the, the reviews for it were pretty keen. Uh, not this one. Uh, uh, Social Fortune has an average rating of 65% on Metacritic. That's amazing. Which I I think that's too low. I would bump that up to, I'd bump that up to a high 70. I think, uh. So I've, Soldier Fortune, I think, is of the games that we've played so far. I think this has held up 
maybe the best. And again, not just because of the PS2 port, but just it's still pretty fun to play. And it right. because it is tapping into a little bit of that Rainbow Six move. Well, again, it doesn't feel it feels like if Rainbow Six and Doom had a baby. Exactly. And so that and it turns it into an action movie where you have all the cool kind of tactical elements of a game like that. Oh, we didn't even mention the fact that it has heritage. Um, so there's now this new trend with Raven Software's games, which all of them have up until Singularity, the inventory. Right. Where Heron Sick and Hexen, that is your, oh, I have a pouch of holding and it is full of potions there's- and <laughs> magical spells. But in this, it's like, okay, John, you got John Mullen, five thanks. slots for guns. Yeah. And so before every level, you can choose what guns you want to take. And you can take pistols or shotguns, machine guns. Right. All the enemies carry guns as well, and you can pick it up from you them. Can pick those and as guns you go up. through levels, you get like you know the Doom style. You go into a room and you find a rocket launcher, and that's like you use the rocket launcher for the rest of the level. But then you can take that with you uh, the next time you do a new level or like a previous one. And so there is a nice little bit of tactical choice in regards to like how do you want to proceed with stuff, which right again. It's great. Yeah, like, Doom wasn't doing this at the time. Well, Quake certainly wasn't doing this at the time, and eventually we wouldn't really see it again until until Call of Duty multiplayer brings it back. Uh, Edge gave the PC version 7 out of 10, though, and called it an above-average first-person shooter. It doesn't break much to the genre, save for its gory depiction of violence, which... Sounds about right. That's about right. The gore in this game... Still holds up, not in the way that it did back in the nineties. It has just evolved into weird dream gore. Is all yeah. I can really explain. If the guys at New Bloods, so if you need inspiration for a horror game, have a look at Social. Look at the gore in Social Fortune. Yeah, let's forward this on to Dave Oshry and see what he says. You know, he's S- send it to the Faith guy. Say, hey, do three D Faith and make yeah, it look like this. That's- we can get Airdorf on here, right? We can have, we could have. Let's, 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 let's get an, let's, let's get ask one of those him new about blood shit FPS games. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get Airdorf. Okay, let's get one of the new blood guys on here, like Dave Zemanski, the guy who made Ooh, Dusk, yeah. and just like have them talk about uh, mid FPS shooters because oh, I God, feel they, like they would, they would love it. They, they would run circles around us in regards to like their. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're like the the detail in their like analysis and stuff. You could even say they would circle strafe us. In they would circle their, strafe us on the topic of of that. <laughs> Just as a quick note, then. Um, so, what was Soldier of Fortune competing with when it came out? What's uh, if you had forty dollars in your pocket? What else could you spend it on? Well, again, this is sort of we talked about this a little bit with Hex and Two, where. That was the end of the, like, that was the last breath of the ray casting games into the polygonal stuff. And we're very much into polygonal games at this point. This is the new era of FPS stuff. And what that includes is Perfect Dark for the N64, the sequel Ooh. to Goldeneye made by the team that would go on to do uh, Time Splitters 1, which is ironic because later in the year, Time Splitters 1 comes out. I have. No idea how they were able to turn around two perf- FPS. Perfect Dark and Time Splitters release in the same year. They release in the same year. Per- t- uh, Perfect Dark near the beginning, Time Splitters near the end. We'll dig into the story a little bit when we do the Time Splitters series, but essentially it's like they leave Rare once production's done and it goes into QA and, you know, final polish. They move right into and they t- producing. T- uh, yeah. And, and time split is one. They turn around in about eight months. Like that's wild. Really quick. I know it, it is like genuinely quite impressive. Also out this year, we talked about him last episode in regards to, he went to go start his own company to work on his dream game. That dream game finally came out. John Romero's die Katana. Oh, wow. Year 2000s. Wow, it took it took that uh, long for Daikatana to come out. Well, yeah, da- Daikatana kept getting pushed, and I think as well it moves it moved from Quake Engine One to Quake to the Quake Two Engine. Like they wanted all the new world bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah, it was on at Id Tech Two. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, that was a. Well, I mean, we'll talk about Daikatana at some point. 
Also out the same year as Daikasana, another Ion Storm game, one that was a bit more critical. That's what well I was about received. to say. I like I knew Deus Ex came out the same that in two thousand. I just didn't yeah. realize Daikatana and Deus Ex came out the same time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is it is amazing. Deus Ex, which I think also went through a tiny bit of production trouble, but not as much as Daikatana. Like Deus Ex was weirdly enough, from the amount of like stuff that you can do in Deus Ex. That had a much quicker development time. So Right. And then Will we ever talk about Deus Ex on the podcast? Well, we probably will in regards to Daikatana, but not on its own because it's too good of a game, unfortunately. So is Counter Strike, the mod that became a smash hit success <laughs> for the original Half Life, built in Gold Source, a game that still has gone on through all sorts of different iterations up until this year, where we have Counter-Strike Global Offensive, made in Source 2. Wow. Um, Just a quick hit for this one, Alien Resurrection. The only reason I mention it is because that's the game that Argonaut Software make where GameSpot have their famous review where they talk about the control scheme using both sticks, where the left stick moves you forward and backwards and strafes left and right, and the other one lets you look up and down and turn left and right, and they think that's an awful control scheme. They hope they never see it ever again. Ah. And then and then Halo comes out the year afterwards, and that becomes the de facto standard uh, based on Alien Resurrection. Which that is, is very wild. And then finally, Star Trek Voyager Elite Forces also comes out this year, which we will be talking about next episode. <laughs> how the hell did the, how the hell did they manage to make two games in one year? Well, I guess we'll get into it when we eventually We'll get talk into about it. That. Now Let's talk about game sales. Which, Let's talk about uh, it. The game was a sales success to the extent that a sequel was greenlit. We will talk about the sequel a tiny bit when we get to the end of the episode. According to PC Data, a firm that tracks sales in the US, the PC version sold 100,000 units by November 2000. NPD Tech World, which also covered the US, reported nearly 300,000 units sold for said PC version by December 2002. So, wow. in PC regards, pretty decent it's success. It's pretty decent. That's, yeah, that, that's, that's a pretty good number. Yeah. But here's some even better numbers. I'm going to ask you, according to PC Data, what were the five best-selling games of the year 2000? Starting with, number one is a game for the Nintendo 64. Uh... My clue is, it came with a, not a rumble pack or a memory pack, but it came with a weird pack for your controller so we could integrate with Game Boy games. Uh, Is it um, like Pokemon Snap? You're on the right lines with Pokemon. Is it a Pokemon Battle Arena? Uh, Yeah. um, What's the... What's, oh, what's another term for a battle arena? What's the what's the like the the like co- somewhere that you would play a sport? Uh, uh, Coliseum, um, stadium. I can't Pokemon remember. Stadium. Pokemon the N64 stadium. Four selling one point seven million units. Number two and number three on the charts are the same game, but for different systems. Okay. Well, actually, no, they're not. They're um, it's the sequel and the um and the original. Actually. Oh, okay. Uh, I was incorrect on that. Both for the PS1. Uh, one of the biggest franchises of the 90s. That's all I can really say on that. Is it uh, Metal, Gear, Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2? It is not Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2. Although, Metal Gear Solid 2 does have a bonus mini game, which is based on this style of game. I forget Metal Gear Solid 2's mini game. <laughs> It's in um, it's in subsistence as a bonus. So it's basically Konami were working on a competitor to this game. Okay. And this they were able to port the engine into uh, Metal Gear Solid, and so you could have Raiden and Snake doing this thing basically in the mini game. Um, is it is it a, a Metal Gear Kart? <laughs> <laughs> Not a go casting game, unfortunately. PS One. Um, God. Hmm. The theme tune to the second game, and by theme tune, what they play in the first couple of in the opening video is 
Uh, Guerrilla Radio by uh, Rage Against the Machine. And the soundtrack is a lot of kind of punky <clears throat> rock tracks with some rap in it as well. Oh, okay. Um, so 2000, is it uh, GTA 2? It's not GTA 2, no. Um, you do travel on something with four wheels, though. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of so many different things that probably aren't on the list. Um, uh, is it is it Twisted Metal? It's not Twisted Metal. No, not a car. It's not not, nothing not, to do with cars. But it nothing. Is but something wheel. something on four wheels. The <sighs> the guy whose game the name of the game the guy whose name these games are associated with. Oh, oh, Tony Hawk, Tony Hawk, Tony Hawk Pro Skater Two, and and one. There we go. I was going to say, unfortunately, he's into NFTs. That was going to be my final clue. So. <laughs> Tony Hawk's 2 sells 1.5 million units, and Tony Hawk's 1 sells 1.3, both for the PS1. Wow, Very popular. Big hits. Number four is a game, is an, is an N64 exclusive. It is a, it's a, is it a sequel? Is it a, Majora's is it another Mask? game in a, what's that? Is it Majora's Mask? It is a yeah. It is much. How do you think of that as? How do you think of that as so quickly? Yeah, because you said it was. You, you were questioning whether it was a sequel, and I was like, "Well, that's got to be. It's got to be Majora's Mask." Yeah, I don't know if it was a sequel or a spinoff or like yeah. uh, something else. Yeah, uh, one point two million units. Which, considering the fact that that game is supposedly a cult classic. I mean, it's not a know, cult classic. It was it was very popular when it came out. Yeah, I think, exactly. I think people. I think I think there's a lot of. Um, here's the weird thing. I think there's a lot of weird perspectives on what was popular and what wasn't, based yeah. on people who look back at, without the context of living through it. Um, yeah. If you're ta- if you're somebody who is into video games at that time, Majora's Mask was not cult classic it was a very it was like yeah. oh it's another oh shit we got another zelda game it's oh, the sequel to oh, ocarina right. of it's, time it's a sequel yeah. to ocarina of time there's it's not it's not culty at all it's it was a pretty big deal at the time when it came out yeah and i think and i don't think there was ever the period where it was like people had turned i think some reviewers were like well it's not like ocarina of time it's doing something else but it's still pretty good and i think people extrapolate that into people hated this game but yeah actually no, it's it, the best one everybody like i had it and i wasn't even like the like i loved ocarina of time it was the mm. the only zelda games i'd played up until that point were one and two because I, I didn't have a super nintendo so sure um so i played the one and two on the original nes and i and ocarina of time and like majora's mask came out and it's like i the I remember a lot of people talking about Majora's Mask as if it was almost like an expansion, like mm-hmm. like the concept of a, of like a DLC, not like a DLC, but an expansion pack to uh, to Ocarina of Time is like, oh, yeah, this is another thing that happens, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, <clears throat> and then finally, number five, we kept dancing around whether a skateboard was a car or not. This is very much a game about cars on the PS One. Gran Turismo. But which one? Two. Gran Turismo 2. Sells <laughs> 1.1 million units for the PS1. What a, a series that I don't think is as big as a deal as it was on the PS1 or the PS2 now, because I think now that we have Forza and stuff, it's sort of taking the it's, shine it's off. It's kind of taking bit. the shine off of it. But when Gran Turismo came out, I think it was one of the first things where it's like, we're not trying at all to model humans we are putting sure. all this energy strictly in just making a car look like a car and when oh, it yeah. first comes out people were like what you can you, what? cars can look that good and yeah. um i think it was like gta not gta 3 gt3 gran turismo 3 that yeah. really which is a ps2 game i want to say um where it's like oh my god um but uh, Gran Turismo 2. Yeah, I remember playing those. I remember playing uh, 
one and two because because my brother was too cool for school for other games but gran turismo was his jam i had never played them until uh when i met with a couple of other youtube essayists back in the summer there was a games expo happening in the science museum in london and Mm. they had a couple of crts set up and one of them was gran turismo 2 and i raced against uh a uh, friend of the cast and noted uh, Gran Turismo fan Hamish Black, and I was surprised. Just even with like it was a it was a digital pad. It didn't have the um, thumbsticks, but I was it does still feels really good. Like yeah, that was I think the thing that made those games so worthwhile is that it car games up until that point were really hit or miss on feeling. Even today, it's it's hard to pull off a, fe- a good feeling driving game. I mean, I remember that was one of the. I remember when Watch Dogs came out, um, yeah. and I was like, I got into a car and I'm like, oh, the driving feels like garbage in this game, absolute garbage. It's like it's 2015. How are we not knowing? Is it, why isn't there just like a basic? system you can buy for your development just a plug and play just plug and play into your engine that makes the driving work better (laughs) like why does that end (laughs) and it's bizarre with ubisoft because they have released some driving games like the crew is a ubisoft game right uh, yeah uh before we end then so soldier of fortune 2 double helix um at this point, I imagine you folks at home have seen the schedule for episodes of Bullet Time. And this isn't the next game that we're covering. We're actually hopping ahead to talk about Star Trek Voyager Elite Forces. And I guess, just kind of briefly, the only reason we're not really covering it was initially... We wanted to just kind of hit the heavy hitters with the Raven stuff. So even though we're doing the two Star Wars games, I think both of them are quite distinct and people have their own sort of, you know, because we have two really good guests for them as well, we were able to kind of get those like really interesting backstories in regards to where they were at when they played them and their, you know, the quirks of these games that they particularly liked and stuff. Soldier of Fortune, again, it isn't really a franchise that people know about. I didn't know about it until we started this podcast. And so we weren't, there wasn't really anybody that we could find who wanted to defend the honor of <clears throat> Soldier of Fortune 2. And again, initially, I was not having a good time with it. There is no <laughs> PS2 version of it. There is an Xbox version of it, which is genuinely awful. But I went back to the PC version. I was able to get Joy to Key working with it so I could like make it feel like a controller. And I put some time into it. it genuinely, the stuff that we really liked about Social Fortune 1, it continues that, but grows it out in regards to you have a few more action sections. There's like a bit where you're on a truck and you like blow stuff up. There's like a cool train espionage section that we got to. I would like to dig into it more in the future but i think to because of the raven mini series not only are we hitting the heavy hitters but we also want to kind of look at their games as a whole i don't think it's super important that we have soldier fortune 2 double helix as a as a single as an episode right now i think it'd be more interesting to return to this maybe even after the raven series is over and kind of because again, I would also like to talk about Cold War at some point, the Call of Duty game that they made, even though that is very much out of this Raven stuff. I wouldn't even mind talking about some of the games that they made that weren't FPS games, like uh, X Men Legends and uh, Wolverine Origins. I think it would be interesting to kind of see the gaps there as well. But I think for now, we're going to, again, we're going to move over to our next episode, which will be Star Trek and. I think we, I, I don't know, Kevin, what's your thoughts? We're happy to kind of return to social force. We'll return to it if there's, if there's a, we'll return to two if there's a, if there's a urge by, yeah. uh, if, if people want to hear us talk about it, Soldier of Fortune 2, we'll go back to it. Um, yeah, I and think then, even, even then, do... maybe, maybe you can force Snake to play it instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be interesting. No, yeah, that's the no, point no, as well. We could potentially swap hosts on it as well. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, even though I've kept joking all the way along in different episodes, like, hey, pay us on the Patreon, so we'll cover this stuff. 
it is more so the Patreon is a good tool in regards to it's a more direct line of communication to us and plus you would technically be count as a production you would count as production on these episodes so you would have some sway in what we talk about but also the review system if there are games that you think you would like to hear us talk about either part of Raven Software stuff that we haven't covered yet or just any other game in general please let us know because again games are a beautiful tapestry that you know we want to cover the FPS genre is like a it's like a big collage and we want to cover as many elements of it as possible to create a fuller picture but uh, we can only do that with your help Kevin, exactly. thanks once again for coming back and talking You're about welcome. It. I'm back. To, I'm here for Raven. Here for it. Here, here for Raven, here for John Mullins. Here for John Where Mullins. Where can people find you beyond this podcast? Uh, you can find my podcast, the Pixelit Podcast, uh, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at the Arcadeologist, and you can find my po- my podcast at Pixelit Pod. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram and our website, pixelitpod.com. Nice. Uh, as usual, I've been James. Uh, you can find me over on Twitter at Hot Cider, H-O-T-C-Y-D-E-R. As we've alluded to, on the next episode of Bullet Time, we boldly go where no Raven miniseries has gone before with Star Trek Voyager Elite Forces, also out in the year... 2000. So, folks, please. Year 2000. The year 2000. So, folks, please join us for that. And until next time, keep blasting. <laughs>